I'm grateful you're watching and listening to this message. I hope that through what you hear, you really grow to understand what God says and how much he has shown his love for you in Jesus. As God's word is open, I pray that he speaks to you. And listen, if it would be helpful for you to talk to someone, please reach out. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Again, thank you for watching. If you have a copy of God's word, could you take it and turn to Proverbs chapter four? Throughout the summer, if you're just joining us, um, throughout the summer we've been opening God's word specifically focused in Proverbs. For today's message, I'd like to read, we'll look at several verses, but I'd like, like to begin in verse 20 of Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4 and verse 20 says this, My son, pay attention to my words. Listen closely to my sayings. Don't lose sight of them. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's body, whole body. Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. Don't let your mouth speak dishonestly. Don't let your lips talk deviously. Let your eyes look forward, fix your gaze straight ahead. Carefully consider the path for your feet and all your ways will be established. Proverbs 4.27, don't, don't turn to the right or to the left. Keep your feet away from evil. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Keep your feet away from evil. The words of caution there reminded me actually of a, a trip I took 20 years ago. Uh, it was when I was here at Brainerd before, had the opportunity to visit Cambodia. And some of you have been in that part of the world. And if you have, you know just how, how beautiful it is. But if you've been there, you also know some parts of Cambodia, certainly 20 years ago, probably even today, can be viciously deadly. It's because at the time, certainly in 2004, but again, I would imagine even today, Cambodia would be one of the leaders in the world in the number of amputees. And that would happen because all over Cambodia, there would be these leftover landmines from decades of war. I remember walking in Cambodia and seeing, man, sign after sign after sign of warning, you know, these red signs alerting you that they could not guarantee that that area was safe from landmines. One of the heartbreaking things of that was to see individuals, even children, walking around those very signs. But the warning signs were clear, right? The warning signs are clear, like, don't, don't go here. Or there's a potential for disaster. Be very, very careful around this place. It helps us process things in Proverbs because Proverbs, Proverbs to read page after page of Proverbs is to read page after page of these if you can appreciate this, these landmines of life that pose such great danger, the Proverbs again and again, and some of you have been reading through Proverbs as we've been studying God's Word together, and you've read again and again of these places that must be off limits to us if we're walking wisely. These areas that while they may even have a pull to us, they prove to be deadly in the end. So far in Proverbs, we've, we've evaluated, we've evaluated some serious questions. I would say, you know, this is a th book that's 3,000 years old, and yet there's relevance today because it's going to push you to ask the question of who am I? Who am I becoming? Am I, am I, the, am I the wise person or am I the fool? Or do I think I can play a middle road and go, I'm just kind of uncommitted yet? 
Proverbs is asking us to evaluate, what is my definition of success? Where's my target? Am I aiming to hit it? Proverbs asks, who's in my ear? What noise is like rising above the commotion of life that I'm listening to, that I'm giving my unfiltered attention to? And here's another question that Proverbs pushes us to ask and pushes us to evaluate, and that is what's off limits in my life? Where do I say, you know what, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. At times when you read Proverbs, it's almost like you're back in the Garden of Eden. God says, you you can enjoy all these things. This whole garden is made for you. Proverbs talks about this life we can enjoy, but this one tree, like, don't, don't go there. Don't go there. There's restriction, and yet it's a world that's beautiful. God's given us a world to enjoy, and there, there are these landmines in this broken world now, these aspects of life that are meant to be out of bounds or we would face massive disaster. So what we can't do is after you read Proverbs, you can't plead ignorance. You can't say, well, I, I just didn't know. We can't say we haven't been warned. The warnings are real. I was reading through, again, Proverbs, the study in preparation for this, and first nine, ten chapters of Proverbs, I came across these words. The warnings are real here, right? Calamity, stress, trouble, destruction, darkness, death, stumbling, instability, ruin, trapped, lost, shattered instantly, beyond recovery, burned, punished, disgraced, rotting. I mean, it's again and again and again and again. It piles up. On the other side, there's life and deliverance and safety and flourishing and succeeding and resting. I mean, so there is some very, very different paths we can go down, and there's one path that Proverbs is telling us, like, this is off-limits. And I wanted to highlight a few of these off-limits areas. I only picked five of them. And uh, doubtless, if you read, you would find more that you could add. I don't, think, I don't think Proverbs is meant to be exhaustive. But I did pick five, and I wanted to highlight some of these. So a familiar place to start, if you've read Proverbs, you know Proverbs will, will warn you and will say there's an off-limits place, and that off-limits is the misuse of speech. So think about your speech, and think about when it's used wrongly. The wise life, the good life, would be to use our speech as a blessing to others. The wise life, the good life, would be to take our words and use them in ways that would honor the Lord and use those words in ways that would bless others. We would be truthful, we would be kind, we'd be courageous, but Proverbs warns us over and over again, we often don't do that, and that's why Proverbs 10.8 would say, foolish lips will be destroyed, and Proverbs 10.14 would say, the mouth of the fool hastens destruction, or Proverbs 11.9, look at this one, it says, with his mouth, the ungodly destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge, the righteous are rescued. Proverbs 11.11, 11, a city is built up by the blessing of the upright, but it is torn down by the mouth of the wicked. Even Proverbs 13, 3 would say, the one who guards his mouth protects his life, but the one who just opens his lips invites his own ruin. Proverbs 16, verse 27 says, a worthless person digs up evil. His speech is like a a scorching fire. A contrary person spreads conflict and gossip, separates close friends. Do you hear it? Like, just don't go there. Don't use your speech in that way. You're going to step on something and it's going to cause all sorts of damage. Don't go there. One with a twisted mind will not succeed, and one with deceitful speech will fall into ruin. Do we see the risk? Do we see it? We can make our justifications. We can say, you know what? I just kind of tell it like it is. I just say whatever comes to mind, and people just have to deal with it. You can say that, and we can rationalize it and justify it, but how many friends will we lose? How many relationships will be destroyed before we get control of our tongue? How much bitterness has to grow in our lives? How deep do we need to find ourselves wrapped in lies because we've told this lie and this lie? I I can't even keep track of all the lies. How much? How far does it have to go? Proverbs tells you. 
Like this is off limits. Don't, don't even open that door. Don't go down that path. When you walk away from good speech, from building, from speech that builds up others, you are walking in a minefield. It seems like it's a matter of when, not if, you're going to step on something and it's going to cause so much damage. And it's needless and it's senseless and it didn't have to go down that way. Proverbs warns us. Proverbs really almost shouts at us. Another, another minefield, and probably many who have read Proverbs are familiar, that another minefield, the kind of an area of like, there's danger, there's danger here, and that is in the area of sexual sin. So Proverbs 2, Proverbs 5, Proverbs 6, Proverbs 7 go to great detail, saying that the wise life is a sexually pure life. It's not because God's against us. God has good in mind, which is why Jesus would teach us, blessed are the pure in heart. They're the ones who will see God. Purity paving the way to intimacy. God has good designs, and so he says, don't go there. Don't do that. So Proverbs sets up a picture of almost like a prostitute, and it really does stand in not just for that particular type of sexual sin, because what we know is there are all kinds of sexual sin. But notice the description of the prostitute here. Her house sinks down to death. Her ways to the land of the departed spirits. None return who go to her. None reach the paths of life. Proverbs 5 says this way, her feet go down to death, her steps head straight for Sheol. Proverbs 5.14, this is the man who realizes what he's done, and he says, I'm on the verge of complete ruin before the entire community. I don't have to read all the verses. The descriptions are are pretty, pretty pointed, pretty clear. The picture in Proverbs 7 is he, he follows her impulsively like an ox going to a slaughter, like deer bounding toward a trap until an arrow pierces its liver like a bird darting into a snare. He doesn't know it will cost him his life. Again, we can make rationalizations. I don't mean to, like, call it other people's sin, but it, but it, it does mean, like, in an environment, in a world where sexual immorality is not just present, it's celebrated, where plot lines will have you cheering for sexual sin, where there's all sorts of justifications. Are we tempted? Are we tempted to make small compromises? Are we tempted to make large compromises? Are we tempted to make it so impersonal? Well, just one thing led to another, as if it's just kind of a force beyond our control. Deep down, we know better. We can see the landmine pretty clearly. Don't go there. That's what Proverbs says. There are more minefields. There are more minefields. There's another area of Proverbs that actually talks about our our stewardship of finances, particularly like our, our misuse of those. And we don't have time to dig into every aspect of that. It's a great, great study Because what Proverbs realizes is what Jesus also teaches, and that is so much of of our hearts revealed in how we handle money. So much of what's going on in our heart is revealed in how we mishandle money. So the wise life would be one of faithful, generous stewardship. Everything we have is a gift. It's all been entrusted to us, and we use it in ways for God's glory. But Proverbs warns us. It, It speaks even kind of connected to stewardship of resources and finances. It, it warns us of the landmines of laziness. There's a, there's a whole section in Proverbs 6 that, that says, you know, humans c- could learn a lot from ants, like that thing that I stomped and I hate crawling on me. Like, we, c- we could learn a lot from that, of how industrious. It, it warns us, are, are there areas where we're lazy, where we're putting things off? Idle hands make one poor, Proverbs 10 says. 
diligent, diligent hands bring riches. Proverbs 11.24 goes at a different angle when it comes to our finances. It says this, one person will give freely and gain more, but another withholds what is right only to become poor. So there's this idea in Proverbs, this isn't the only one, but it's, it speaks of just the stinginess of like a, a hoarding, like, no, I'm not giving things away. It's mine. I work hard for it. I, it's mine. And yet what a different pathway to give freely. Proverbs has a lot to say about just the accumulation of debt that turns you upside down. Proverbs has a lot to say about a dishonest money. Proverbs 2017, food gained by fraud is sweet to a person, but afterward his mouth is full of gravel. Or Proverbs 28, 22 says there are those who are greedy and they're always in a hurry to get wealth. And so there's compromises that are made because you just want money and you want it quick and you think you got a path to do it. And so you kind of ignore this and ignore that because you can get your hands on some more money, or at least there's a chance you can. Proverbs also tells us that a landmine area in finances is thinking it's only and always about money. A person that always just can't seem to get it. And you don't have to be, you don't have to be significantly wealthy to think life is all about money. Sometimes the people that are most consumed with money are the people that don't have it. But they can tell you everybody who does and what they would do if they did have it. Proverbs says that wealth is not profitable on a day of wrath. Proverbs says in Proverbs 11, 7, when the wicked person dies, his expectation comes to nothing and hope placed in wealth vanishes. How we handle the things that God gives us matters. Money is, it's necessary, but it's dangerous. It's dangerous. We can be lazy, but we can easily love money. We can grow materialistic and like in a culture like ours, we may not even get checked on our materialism. We keep up with another person. We buy something. We, we try to stay ahead just the, enough and we justify it again. We make sort of rationalizations. We get envious of others. They have something we want. We easily get things twisted. We cross small lines at first. We make compromises. All the while, we're, we're walking away from promises God has made to provide for every one of our needs. We're walking away from being content, telling ourselves, ah, if I just had a little bit more, if I could just get... There's landmines. There's another landmine. There's another kind of area of life landmines, and that is Proverbs will warn us of substance abuse. The wise life would is a self-controlled life, a life that flourishes. In 1 Corinthians language, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whether you eat or drink, like, do it all to the glory of God. That, that's, that's the goal. We can eat and we can drink for His glory. You're enjoying life. You're enjoying what God's given you. But you're not con controlled or consumed by it. Proverbs points this out on multiple, multiple occasions. Proverbs 20 and verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker, beer is a brawler. Whoever goes astray because of them is not wise. Or Proverbs 23 widens the lens a little bit, doesn't it? Don't associate with those who drink too much wine or with those who gorge themselves on meat for the drunkard and the glutton will become poor, and grogginess will clothe them in rags. The end of Proverbs 23 says this, who has woe, who has sorrow, who has conflicts, who has complaints, who has wounds for no reason, who has red eyes, those who linger over wine, those who go looking for mixed wine, don't gaze at wine because it is red, because it gleams in the cup, goes down smoothly, in the end it bites like a snake, stings like a viper, your eyes will see strange things and you will say absurd things, you will be like someone sleeping out at sea or lying down on the top of a ship's mast, they struck me, but I feel no pain, they beat me, but I didn't know it, when will I wake up? I'll look for another drink. I realize Christians have different views on alcohol. I understand that. And I know that Proverbs here, so it, it doesn't say anything about drugs. It doesn't say anything here about marijuana. 
But still, I think every Christian can recognize this is making us ask some questions. Am I doing things that are unwise? Is something beginning to take control of me? And if it is, am I, am I lying to myself? Am I becoming a different person? Am I finding that I, I'm, hiding, I'm hiding things from people that I know love me and that I love? Do I see where things are headed? Has it now become a pattern where every single day, every, all the time I'm having to just take the edge off a little bit? Are there things that it's, it's just so hard that I feel like I'm, I'm making an excuse? I've just got to numb because life's too hard and I, I, I don't want to deal with it. Is the substance becoming isolating? Is it cutting you off from the people that you actually need close? Are you beginning to lose perspective? Proverbs is going to say there is an area and you have to tread so lightly because there, there are landmines and people better than us have walked right into those and life has never been the same. Maybe one of the most dangerous landmines that maybe you can point to like, yep, I don't do that. Yep, I don't do that. Yep, I'm careful there. But one of the most stubborn or most dangerous landmines is all of our stubbornness and pride. The wise life would be one where we live under, under the fear of the Lord, humble before him. Proverbs warns us. I mean, if we don't think this is a landmine, if we've got eyes to see like what's going on over there and go like, yeah, people shouldn't do that. But we miss some of these things because Proverbs says this, when arrogance comes, disgrace follows, but with humility comes wisdom. Arrogance leads to nothing but strife, but wisdom is gained by those who take advice. Everyone with a proud heart is detestable to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. And then there's this picture in Proverbs 1 in verse 29. It's talking about fools and it says, they, the fools hate knowledge. They didn't choose to fear the Lord. They were not interested in my counsel. This is kind of wisdom speaking. They rejected all my correction. And so they will eat the fruit of their way and be glutted with their own schemes. So it's like wisdom is saying, you wanted to do it your way. You would not listen. You were so prideful. You were so stubborn. You thought you had it all together. And we continue, the complacency of fools will destroy them. Are there, are there those like, are there those markers, those early warning detection systems of like, man, a lot of the stories you tell are all about how you were the hero. Every time you tell, every time you talk to someone, it's kind of all about you. Or you always are rolling your eyes at all the idiots you, that are beneath you that you have to deal with. Or someone gently tries to correct you and you turn it on them and you prove like the 5% you, that they got right, you, you undermine all of that and you just lash out at them not realizing they may have meant to help you. We twist things, and how much, how much damage do we cause? We need these words. So Proverbs, again, those are just five. Proverbs takes us through many, many more, and it's doing us a great service. What inventory do we need to stop and take? What are the areas that are tough spots for you? I will say, though, that navigating all of this, as I, as I kind of walk through any sort of list, navigating that all can be pretty challenging. Because this is what we do. Sometimes we rightly hear about, man, all that stuff can ruin your life. It can ruin your life. It can send you down a path of ruin and destruction and danger. And so, and so we begin to make rules. And over time, we make more rules. And over time, we make it all about keeping the rules. Some of you have come from a very legalistic background where 
like this message may not even needed to be preached in some ways because everybody was just so like, well, no, we got all, all kinds of rules that keep us from doing that. But over time, the point becomes the rules, not a relationship with Jesus. Over time, you move, move further and further from grace and you lose track of the good life that you actually were trying to pursue because you're just so bent on like, well, I don't do that, and I don't do that, and I better stop doing that, and I better stop doing, and the rules multiply. And then pride comes, and then superiority comes, and then we're judgmental, and we, we leave no room for others to have different conclusions because we, we got it. We got the rules, and we're keeping the rules, and everybody should just keep the rules. It's danger. It's, it's a danger even to talk about the landmines because I realize we can go there. One of the challenges about talking about some of these landmines, though, also is that for all of the rules we may make, we, listen, we will always fail to keep them all. We aren't innocent. Literally no human being in this room has behaved themselves all the time. We can pull out all the new labels we want to justify things. We can find clever ways to mask it. But today, could we not, could, I mean, all of us, can we not rec recognize that our flesh is weak, our world is enticing in all the wrong ways? We have a spiritual enemy who is bent on our destruction. So when we talk about the landmines, we're right to be suspicious of our heart and our mind. We're right to be skeptical of all the rationalizations and the justifications we may make. We're right to recognize the weaknesses we have. We will not make it through life, avoiding all the landmines. Oh, you, you may avoid some that others step on, but we will not, we will not make it through smooth sailing. Never stepped on one, never caused any damage, never even a threat of ruin our lives. Some of us know this because nothing of what I talked about is hypothetical. Maybe it's devastating even to hear of sexual sin because it, it brings back memories. Maybe substance abuse has been a very, very big part of your life. Maybe you've devastated people with your speech. And some of this hits very close to home and gets painful. Or maybe it's like life hasn't quite blown up yet, but it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. Proverbs tells us it like it is, and we need to hear it loudly and clearly. There's nothing I want to do to go, yeah, it doesn't matter. Just turn down the volume. It's okay. Live however you want to. It'll, it'll all probably work out in the end. No, not when we read Proverbs. But I will say in places of deep brokenness, you often find something beautiful. In a world like filled with landmines and people who've stepped on them. People in this room people like you and me. In places of deep brokenness, you often find something beautiful. As I was reading about landmines, I came across a, a Cambodian man named Aki Ra. Uh, his story is tragic in lots of ways. He was orphaned. He was orphaned by the Khmer Rouge when the, the fighting started, his parents died. It's even to the point where he doesn't even know how old he is. He doesn't know what year he was born because his first few years were so traumatic. And as a child, he was drafted into the army, and one of his jobs as a child was to plant landmines. Apparently, he was good at what he did, which describes just how sick of a childhood that would be. After the wars, when he's in his early 20s, he found a new life, and that life was deactivating mines. You can read the story. He used a knife, a hoe, a leatherman, a stick. I mean, he's cleared thousands of landmines. He's cleared landmines where he planted them in those areas. He's gone to villages where they suspected a landmine would, would be, and he's gone to those and deactivated those. He's began to educate groups on the dangers of landmines. He even set up a primitive landmine museum and any proceeds that he got from tourists, he would take to do something else. Another, another amazing ambition, he did work in these villages, and he would, found, he would find that kids had stepped on these landmines and often didn't have anybody to take care of them as they were child amputees. 
And so he would begin to open up his home and bring people in. He brought, they say, even a couple dozen to live with him and his wife. Imagine, imagine giving your life to demining. They say this work came at great personal cost, suffered depression, nightmares, mood swings, anxiety. He gave his life to serving those who have been severely affected. When I read of that story and thought of his work of healing, I mean, you just can't help but be touched and moved, but it did make me think of, it did make me think of something else. It made me think of another one who came, one who could not and would not leave you in your misery. And this one didn't have a past of seeking to do harm. He only came motivated to help and to heal. You see, Scripture doesn't downplay the consequences of a broken world. It starts with the Garden of Eden and tells us there were deadly decisions there. As humans, we just couldn't be satisfied with trees of life, so we decided we'd just rather eat death. We should be able to stay away from deadly spiritual minds. We should have the common sense to go, I'm not going to do that. I won't do that. I'm not going to go down that path. But life would be so much better if we could just live that way, but we don't. And our lives are headed toward destruction. And maybe even today you feel like, like Curtis says, you talk about the landmines. I've stepped on too many and my life is too broken. And I, I, I come to church, but I, I can't get over the guilt of the, of the pain that I've caused, the destruction for others, the shame I feel. But I want you to hear, like, not of a Cambodian man, but the man Jesus, who came and successfully navigated all the landmines of life. And he was tempted. Scripture says he was tempted, but without sin. And if we, if we did follow his steps, we'd never go wrong. We never would. And yet, instead of being celebrated as, like, what a great hero, Jesus was executed, crucified, he took on our sin and its consequences. So all those words that I described before, like disgrace and pain and rejection and death and darkness, he took all of those on. So for all of the times you hear, like, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, we could never do that. We needed him to navigate the minefield for us to take on the suffering. We need grace, and he did this. By the way, he did this for our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins. His life and death were an offering to the Lord, to the Father, for you. He gives us his righteousness. So our record is as if we navigated the minefield successfully because he did for us. And he's risen, and he's alive, and he comes to put things back together for you. This is why old things pass away. Everything's becoming new. And he sent his spirit to guide you each step of the way home. So where does that leave you? It leaves you knowing you don't have to run and hide. But you must confess Jesus is your Lord. You must rely on him to do for you what you could not do. And it does mean this. Christians live in deep gratitude, deep trust. If any bit of what Jesus has done for you thinks, like you can go back to Proverbs and go, yeah, it doesn't matter. Hardly, it doesn't matter. Like, how could we ever think that? If we know there's a wise path, why would we not want to walk it? The landmines are just as serious. They still wreak just as much havoc. Proverbs, it doesn't mean less to us. It means more. But we know we have one who experienced the full brunt of devastation. And he's invited us into a life. He invites you regardless of what you've stepped on. He invites you into a life of submission. He invites you into a life of correction. He invites you into a life of repentance, should you stray. He invites you into a life of continual help from someone who is bent on your good. Committed to it. Committed to it. What else could you ask for? What else could we ask for? I want to pray for those that maybe have not yet met that Savior, that you would meet him today, that you, Scripture says this, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But 
but I also want to pray for us who are navigating these landmines that God will hold us and guide us, restore us, rebuild us. Let's pray. Oh Lord, how we need to hear warnings and we need to recognize our own tendency towards sinfulness. Father, this room, if we look at our sin, we're filled with regret. We're victims, but we're also, we're also rebels. And so we need your grace and we need your help. We turn to you as the one who experienced the full brunt of our sin. And Jesus, we ask for forgiveness and healing and a restored life. Lord, in the meantime, until we meet you, would you guide us safely? Would you make, oh Lord, help us to see sin for the devastation it is? Help us to see the right path with all the wisdom that it provides. Give size to see that more clearly, maybe than ever before. Thank you, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.